Well, hello and welcome to the Academy of Hypnosis. I'm Alan Marriott, Master Hypnotist, Hypnotherapist and Man of the Mind. Watching this DVD now will help you to have a better understanding of hypnosis and how your mind works. And that's going to save us a lot of time when your session actually begins. Now, for you to understand how hypnosis works, it's very important for you to understand how your mind works. Let's look at it and as if we have three very separate and very distinct minds that do different things and that have a hard time interrelating and communicating with each other. First, we have the conscious mind. That's where we are right now. Below that level of awareness, we have something called the subconscious mind and the deeper part of us, the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind is that part of us that does two things. First, it controls the strength or weakness of the immune system and secondly, it controls all the automatic bodily functions such as our breathing, our eyes blinking, that kind of thing. The conscious mind is where we spend most of our time. I want you to understand that it basically only does four things and no more. The first thing it does, it analyzes. It's the part of us that looks at a problem, analyzes the problem and figures out a way to solve those particular problems. The conscious mind is also the part of us that makes all the hundreds of decisions that are necessary just to get through an average day. Decisions that we think are automatic, but in fact they're not. Things like, should I open the door? Should I turn the water on? Should I tie my shoes? Well, we think those things are automatic functions, but we must make a decision as to whether or not we want to do these things and that makes it conscious because that makes it now. The second part of the conscious mind is a part that starts to get us into a little trouble sometimes. Now we call this the rational part of our conscious mind. This part of us must give us a reason why we behave in any particular fashion. You see, if we don't have a reason for the things that we do, we become anxious, nervous, frustrated. And if it goes on long enough, it can even lead to serious mental illness. The only problem with the reasons the rational mind may give us on why we behave in any particular fashion is it's never original. A smoker says he smokes because it calms him, makes him feel relaxed, gives him time to pause and gather his thoughts. Before the smoker developed their habit, they'd heard other people that smoke say, I smoke because it makes me feel calm and relaxed. Now, there is one important thing that you must understand. The reason the rational mind gives us for why we behave in any particular fashion is never original and almost always incorrect. You don't start smoking because it makes you feel calm. You start when you need security. The next part of the conscious mind is what we call willpower. Now, we are all familiar with willpower. You might say, I'm going to put down this packet of cigarettes and nothing on God's earth will ever make me start smoking again. Well, we all know how long that lasts, right? The willpower weakens and then the old habit pattern comes right back again. Now, the last part of the conscious mind is what we call working memory. That's the memory we need every day. How do I find my way to work? What's my husband or wife's name? What are my children's names? What is my phone number? We're talking about the kind of memories that we need just to get through an average day. Now, this is all that the conscious mind does. It does nothing else. This part of your mind is very logical and very analytical, and it's frequently wrong. Now, where the real you and me and everyone else lives is in the level below the conscious mind, and that's called the subconscious mind. So let's look at the subconscious mind. This part of us is extremely powerful. It can make you into anything that you'd like to be, rich and famous, thin, happy or sad. It is the real us. The subconscious mind is very much like a computer. If you go out and buy a computer, put it on your desk and ask it a question, it will not be able to answer you. Now the reason for this is that the computer has not yet got the correct programming. Now a computer can only operate based on the programming that is placed inside of it. It has no choice. If you change the programming in a computer,
that you buy at a store, it can no longer operate on the old programming. It must now operate on the new programming. This is the way our subconscious mind works. It's a computer. It functions on the same rules and regulations as an electronic one does, only it's much, much more powerful. Our subconscious mind absorbs over 2.3 million pieces of data per second, and we are constantly programming our computer every day of our lives to our life experiences. When we are born, our computers are basically unprogrammed. Every single day we are adding programming to our internal computer. Now, the primary rule of our computer is this. It must make us into the type of person that it perceives us to be based on all the programming that has been placed into it and continues to be placed into it until the day we die. If that computer of ours, based on its programming, says that we're fat, we're fat. If it says that we're thin, or a smoker, a success, or a failure, that's exactly what we are. Our programming has been placed in there from many sources, and it must operate on this programming. So, let's take a look at it, at some of the operational software that's required and that's inside this internal computer. First is all of our memory. Everything that we have ever seen, felt, smelt, tasted, and heard since the day we were born. We think of these things that have happened to us in the past as either forgotten or retained in the form of memory. What we're doing here is we're talking about the working memory of the conscious mind. The subconscious mind is like a digital camera. Everything that has ever happened to you is locked permanently into the memory banks of your subconscious mind. We never forget anything. If there is a reason to, in hypnosis, we can access that memory bank and it seems like we can actually travel back in time. In regression hypnosis, we can travel back and relive your first birthday or even your birth. We never forget anything in the subconscious, only at the conscious level. Now the second programming we have in the subconscious mind is habits. Now you have three kinds of habits. You have some good habits, you have some bad habits. But you really, most of our habits aren't good or bad. Most of our habits are, in fact, useful habits. We automatically respond in a certain fashion when something happens. When the telephone rings, we don't look at it and wonder what it is. We automatically pick it up, right? Now, the next thing in our subconscious mind is emotion. Of course, we wouldn't want to be without our emotions, love and caring and all those other good emotions. But sometimes our emotions get us into a little trouble. Understand, the conscious mind cannot deal with emotions because that's not part of its job. Anytime we need emotion, our conscious mind simply parts like the Red Sea and we deal with this particular situation from our irrational, juvenile-like but highly intelligent subconscious mind. We've all emotionally overreacted to something and afterwards when things had died down a little and the analytical conscious mind took over, we thought, well, why did I say that? Why did I do that? It was so stupid. And that inner subconscious mind laughed and said, yeah, but it was so much fun. This has certainly happened to all of us at some time or other. Now, the next thing in the subconscious mind, and probably the most important part of us, is it is our protective mind. The subconscious mind must protect us against danger, real or imagined. You see, the subconscious mind does not know the difference between something that is real and something that is imagined, and it must protect us against all danger. Many people come to see me for weight loss, and on many occasions, They'll tell me about their eating problems, and no matter what they do, they just can't lose weight. Many times, I will ask their subconscious mind if they want to lose weight, and in most cases, the answer's no. You must understand that consciously, they really do want to lose weight. However, because the subconscious mind doesn't want to lose weight, for whatever reasons, they're fighting a losing battle. Years of experience told me that people with a weight issue didn't usually have an eating problem. 
in many cases, an event in their past caused their subconscious mind to protect them by making them overweight. So why would the subconscious mind want to be overweight? Well, let me give you an example with one particular client, Susan. When she was just a little six-year-old girl, her stepfather abused her very badly. She told her mother, and her mother didn't believe her. She felt guilty, as if it was her fault, as if she was doing something wrong. But she didn't gain weight at that point. Now, when she was in high school, she felt that all the boys in high school were just trying to hurt her. Now, that didn't cause her to gain weight either. But when she was 24 years old and she married the white knight, the man that could do no wrong, well, on their honeymoon, the second day when they were married, they were having dinner. And what happened, he decided he wanted to cleanse his soul and show her how much he loved her. He told her that when he was just a young guy in the army, he used to pick up women every night and just kind of use them. Well, you can imagine what the subconscious mind felt about this. The one man that this woman felt she could trust would actually do this to a woman? The subconscious mind then went back into its memory banks and into its computer and into that, all that information it had stored. And it simply said, the stepfather hurt you very badly. The boys in high school were trying to hurt you very badly. And now this one man, this one man that you could trust about every other man says he could do this to a woman, then certainly he has the capability of doing this to you. It made this decision instantly. Men hurt women, and therefore, it must protect her against men. Now, it can't teach her karate, it can't buy her a gun, so it protected her in the only way it could, and this woman began gaining weight rapidly. Now, very soon, she became so fat that certainly no men would any longer have any interest in her, and she was simply protected. That's how the subconscious mind protects us, sometimes in a way that, yes, I'm sure we prefer it didn't, but protection is its primary job. Remember, all bad behavior has a positive underlying intention. Now, the last part of the subconscious mind is a negative part of us. Although the subconscious is so powerful, it is also the laziest part of us. It doesn't like to do work. It doesn't like to do the work that is required to accept positive suggestions to give us the change in the areas that we'd like to have change. It likes to keep things the way they are. It takes too much work to make change. Positive suggestions are one of the most difficult things to get into our subconscious minds. On the other hand, negative suggestions go into this inner part of us like a hot knife through butter. Because, well, it doesn't take any work to accept a negative suggestion. The subconscious hates a struggle and will do anything it can to avoid it. Let me show you how this works. Imagine a very heavy person as they get out of the shower. They're standing in front of the mirror. They're drying themselves off. Now, what do you think they're saying to themselves as they're looking into that mirror? Gosh, am I fat and ugly. Now that idea, it goes straight into the subconscious mind and the subconscious mind says, well, yes, that matches the programming that I have in here, that matches my perception of you, therefore, it accepts that suggestion. So the perception of that individual being fat and ugly becomes stronger and, well, they become even heavier. On the other hand, if you take that same heavy person and stand them in front of that mirror and have them say, I'm thin, I'm trim, and I'm attractive. That goes towards the subconscious mind, and the subconscious mind says, no, that doesn't match my programming. And of course, it's not allowed in. It's rejected immediately. So how do we get suggestions into the inner mind? Now, it is so important for you to understand this. If an idea, a thought, or a concept is allowed to go into the subconscious mind, it must happen. You're changing programming, and that inner mind must respond to new programming. Let me explain how it works. You make a decision, let's say, to stop smoking. You make your mind up at the conscious level that nothing in the whole wide world is going to stop you from ending this smoking habit. 
Now, your conscious mind says, that's wonderful, and I support you 100%. You're going to be healthier. You're not going to get emphysema or heart disease. But to have change effectively happen, you have got to get it down into your computer in order to change that programming. So, you start to send that idea down into the subconscious mind. But here's the problem. There's one more part of the conscious mind that I haven't told you about yet. Let us imagine that the conscious mind is an employee of the subconscious and that it only has one job. That job is to stop any suggestion of change that we give ourselves or that we receive from an outside source. We have a part of us called the critical factor and it's like a filter of the conscious to the subconscious mind. Now, in a way that we don't understand but we do know happens, the critical factor says well, this person wants to stop smoking. Can I let this suggestion in? Now remember, if that suggestion goes into the inner mind, it must happen. But the subconscious mind says, wait a minute, he's been smoking for 20 years. He needs cigarettes for security, or whatever reasons there may be for that individual. It says, besides, do you realize how much reprogramming I'll have to do I just don't feel up to it. I don't want to do it. Reject the suggestion. The critical factor is like a bouncer on the door of an exclusive nightclub and it has one job of keeping out anyone that doesn't already have a membership. The suggestion is rejected immediately and it can't get into the inner mind to make the changes required. The critical faculty is it's like a filter. And without it, you'd be constantly bombarded with information that you do not need to be consciously aware of. Now, if a suggestion cannot get into the inner mind, we only have one other place to take that idea, and that is to willpower. Remember, willpower is in the conscious. And we all know how long willpower lasts, right? How many diets have you been on? How many times have you tried to stop smoking? You get the idea. So, how do we get positive suggestions into that subconscious mind? With hypnosis. Now, what hypnosis does is this. It bypasses the critical factor that is blocking part of our conscious mind. It's like giving it some cash and sending it off to the shops until we tell it to come back. Now, this is what most people who are ignorant of hypnosis think hypnosis really is. If this was all hypnosis was, then some of the stories you may have heard about hypnosis might be true. Things like, I can control you, or I can make you do anything I want you to do when you'd have to do it. God did not leave us that vulnerable. Yet, this is true up to this point. The instant this critical factor of our conscious mind is bypassed, what happens is we go into a very, very deep state of hypnosis. Under hypnosis, you will always be aware of everything that is going on around you. In fact, you may become more aware of sounds and feelings, etc. But they'll no longer disturb you as you become more focused internally. You must realize that we go in and out of natural hypnosis all of the time. Have you ever been driving somewhere and suddenly realized that you don't remember passing the last three or four streets? The correct name for this kind of natural hypnosis is called driver's trance, and it happens to us all. You see, driving has become second nature to you, and you no longer have to consciously think about it, allowing you to think of other things that you may have to do while the subconscious mind does its job. Have you ever been in a rush for a meeting, got into the car and suddenly realized that you'd forgotten your bag or your briefcase, whatever it might be? So you rush back into the house, you place your keys down for a moment, and you go and get whatever it was that you'd forgotten. Now, while still rushing, you go to get your keys and suddenly notice they've disappeared. You can't find them anywhere. Now, at this stage, you take a deep breath in frustration and suddenly... Your keys are right where you left them. You see, you were in too much of a rush to get in your car and drive, which means the chances of you having an accident are much higher. So your subconscious mind caused what's called a negative hallucination, making your keys temporarily invisible to you to protect you. Now, 
after taking a deep breath, which in return confuses the mind and tells you that you're in a safe and calm place, you become so much more relaxed and find yourself no longer in such a rush, therefore your keys are returned to you and off you go. Now, the more we go into hypnosis, the more our conscious mind becomes alert. In the deeper levels of hypnosis, your conscious mind is two to three hundred percent more alert than you are this very moment. All of your five senses, including hearing, smelling, tasting, and seeing, are hundreds of times better than they are right now. So when you're hypnotized, you are not asleep. You are extremely alert, probably more alert and clear-minded than you have ever been before. The important thing to understand about this is that the conscious mind takes on a different role when you're in hypnosis. I want you to think of it as playing the role of the guardian of the gates, protecting you. When you receive a suggestion in hypnosis, you hear it loud and clear. Now, when you hear that suggestion, and these are the tools for success or failure with hypnosis, when you hear that suggestion with your conscious mind, you must make one of four decisions about that suggestion. Which decision you make determines whether that suggestion is allowed to enter your subconscious mind or whether it is rejected. If it's allowed to enter your subconscious mind, you will have the change that you are here to achieve. If it's rejected, there'll be no change. The first decision could be when you hear the suggestion, you think or say to yourself something like, I like that suggestion. I know that this one is going to work for me. Now, that mental attitude at the conscious level allows that suggestion to go into your computer, the subconscious mind, and change begins. Now, unfortunately, you have three other choices. The next choice could be, besides actually hating a suggestion or feeling it is something against your morals or beliefs, it's perhaps that suggestion is just a tiny little bit uncomfortable to you. Well, if that suggestion sounds just the tiniest bit uncomfortable to you, for any reason at all, it is automatically blocked with the conscious mind and it's not allowed to enter into the computer, meaning that there's no change. The next choice could be that you are neutral about the suggestion. You don't care if you get it and you don't care if you don't get it. It's kind of a meaningless suggestion to you. The conscious mind automatically blocks that suggestion and it can't get into the computer. The last choice you have is probably the choice which causes most people to fail with hypnosis. Now, if they do fail, it goes something like this. When you hear the suggestion, you say to yourself, Ooh, I like that suggestion. I hope it works. Well, the word hope is the twin sister of the word try. And try means automatic failure. Look back on your life now and be honest with yourself. Anytime you tried to do something, you failed. If you look back at your life and notice that anytime you said to yourself, I'm going to do it, and there was absolutely no question about it, you did it. And you probably did it very well. Hope is the twin sister of try. You could hope for the cows to come home. It doesn't mean that they're going to come home. So if you say hope or try, that suggestion is going to be blocked immediately by the conscious mind and it's not going to be allowed to enter the computer and therefore there'll be no change. If you eliminate the words hope and try from your personal and professional vocabulary, from this moment on, within a week or two, you're going to feel better than you've ever felt in a long, long time. Now, the only time a suggestion is allowed to go into your computer is if you take the mental attitude when you hear that suggestion, I like that suggestion. I know that that suggestion's going to work for me. And that's how easy it is. If you allow me to be your guide, I'll show you to how to place yourself into a beautiful state of hypnosis, feeling the physical relaxation and the mental alertness. If you allow me to be your guide, I'll show you how to stay there until we're finished. If you don't want to be in this beautiful state of hypnosis, the slightest thought by you and it's all over. 
and you're just going to bring yourself back to a normal state of awareness. The most important thing of all is if you accept the suggestions given to you with the correct mental attitude, I like it, I know it's going to work for me, you'll have the change in the way that you want it. If you take one of the other choices, you'll fail. With formal hypnosis, I can't force a suggestion into your mind. Only you can allow it to happen. Hypnosis is 100% consent state by you. You must allow things to happen. Now, I want you to understand that anyone, as long as their IQ is above 70 and they want hypnosis, can go into a very deep level of hypnosis. How fast? Just like that. Now, the only thing that keeps a person from going into that beautiful state of physical relaxation and mental alertness is if they have a fear or a misconception about what hypnosis really is. Some people feel that when you are in hypnosis that you're asleep. Hypnosis has nothing to do with sleep. Nothing at all, in fact. If you're asleep, I can't even help you. Some people are afraid they won't wake up. Well, that's true. I agree with that. I've never known anyone to wake up from hypnosis. You see, there's only one thing that you can wake up from, and that's sleep. If you're not asleep, you can't wake up, right? One will emerge from hypnosis. And any time you would want to emerge from hypnosis, all you have to do is have the slightest thought that you don't want to be in this state anymore, and instantly it's over, and you're back to your normal awareness. Then there is that powerful misconception that many people have that says, I can control you, I can make you do anything I want you to do. This is not so. Remember, you have those four choices when you hear a suggestion, and the only time a suggestion is allowed to enter your computer is if you say, I like it, I know it's going to work. I can't force that in, I can't control you. Now, not with conventional hypnosis anyway. I want you to know right now that you and you alone are responsible for your success. You and you alone are responsible for your failure. What mental attitude you take when you hear a suggestion determines success or failure. Some people have the misconception that they will tell me all their deep dark secrets when they're hypnotized. Remember that when you're hypnotized, you have more mental alertness. You are more in control of anything you choose to do or say while you are in hypnosis. More than you are right now, in fact. If you don't want to tell me something, then you won't. If I was to ask you, for example, for information that was none of my business, you would simply tell me that it's none of my business. As a matter of fact, if I wanted that kind of information from you, I would have a much better chance of obtaining it now in your normal conscious awareness. Well, because right now, you're mentally dull compared to your mental capabilities when you are in hypnosis. Even stage hypnosis operates by the same rules as clinical hypnosis. You always have the choice as to whether or not you want that suggestion. If you don't want it, truthfully don't want it, it will be rejected and there'll be no change or if on stage there'll be no reaction to the suggestion. You must understand hypnosis is up to you. When we do our hypnotherapy session together I will always treat you in a professional manner ensuring that you remain safe at all times and you can rest assured that I will always use the best of my training and therapeutic knowledge to ensure you get the best changes possible for the reason that you're visiting. All you have to do from this moment forward is to follow and accept all of my instructions and suggestions to the utmost of your ability and without question. Simply accept that everything from this moment on, everything that I say from this moment on is the complete and honest truth. Do everything that I ask you to do with the mental attitude of, I want this, I like this, I know that this will work for me. If you do this, then there's nothing in the whole wide world that will stop you from entering into a deep level of hypnosis and receiving the correct programming that you require. 
I've had an awful lot of training in hypnosis for an awful lot of years. I know exactly what to say to my clients, and if they accept those suggestions, they'll have wonderful change, and if they reject them, they'll have no change. So my success rate is always perfect. Will yours be perfect? If you accept the suggestions with the correct mental attitude, I like it, I want it, I know it's going to work for me, yes, you will have 100% success. Remember, hypnosis is a wonderful, wonderful way to change your life, and it's available to you. Well, thank you for giving me your undivided attention. I look forward to working with you. You're going to do fantastic.